Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, since Andrew Tate reverted, you've been asking me to do a reaction video to him. I didn't do it right away because guess what? He just reverted to Islam and I said congratulations. Now he has to start his life as a Muslim. Since then, a lot of things happened, of course. He went to jail and there he was able to read the Quran every day. And like that, I'm certain he was able to strengthen his faith, his Iman in Islam even more so. Therefore, now it is interesting to hear what he has to say about Islam and why he became a Muslim on the absolutely viral exclusive interview by Patrick Beth David from Valuetainment. If this is the first time for you seeing my face, I myself come from an Orthodox Christian background and I reverted to Islam, just as Andrew Tate here. Therefore, it is of course very interesting for me to hear why he left Christianity, why he became a Muslim. With no further ado, guys, let's have a look. What's been your evolution of your faith and where, where are you at today? Yeah, I think Newton's, I think it's third law, equal and opposite force, what you just said there is absolutely true. There has to be an equal and opposite force to all the evil in the world. And that, the equal and opposite force to all that evil has to be God. And I've talked about this at length even with atheists, and I try and say that regardless of whether you're an atheist or not, you're thinking of God as a man in the sky, but you need to think of God as a concept as a whole. And once you do that, it's impossible to accept that he doesn't exist, right? A couple of things to unpack here. He speaks of God as the opposite force to the devil. I would say that good is the opposite force to evil. He is absolutely accurate here. However, if we're thinking about God, we're thinking about a being that is absolutely transcendent of all. He is the creator of all things, and therefore he is the creator of the devil as well. Therefore, if we see evil in the world and we see goodness in the world, of course, those are manifestations. Those are contrasts. This is the battle between good and evil. However, we have to realize as believers that nobody is as powerful as God is because God is the creator. So therefore, the devil is not in direct competition to God. He's not a direct adversary to God. He's an adversary to us in comparison to God. He is absolutely nobody. And then he mentioned God as a concept and not a man in the sky. I believe that Christianity did a lot of damage here with the Trinity and with the understanding of God the Father, God the Son etc etc because like that you anthropomorphize god and yes in the end the atheist says i don't believe in a sky daddy but thank god in islam we do not have that concept in islam god is all transcendent he is the creator of all things he is indeed the necessary being he is the necessary being for there to be the first cause i said to the atheist i said let's say there was two islands you're shipwrecked right and there's two islands both of them are full of savages on one, one island you and your friend are shipwrecked. On one island, your friend goes and he crashes and they, they kill him and they eat him. And you go to another island and they want to kill you and eat you, but they don't because it's against their religion. Mm -hmm. Did God save your life? Who cares? Who doesn't even know the name of their God? But their God said, don't kill shipwrecked survivors. And now you're alive. So their God saved your life. The concept of God in and of itself saved your life. You owe God just for the concept of it, the idea of it. So Again, I absolutely understand what he means here and I see the value in speaking about concepts, especially in this day and age where you have many atheists and he being an ex-atheist himself, he understands how to talk to the people. However, what he is describing here is utilitarianism. He is speaking about what would benefit a society and therefore, no matter if God is real or not, as long as we believe in a God, we all benefit through that. And this is yet again something that Jordan Peterson has discussed in the the past. If you ask a Jordan Peterson, he cannot tell you if he really believes in God, yes or no. He can only tell you about the benefits of believing in God. What do you mean do? What do you mean you? What do you mean believe? And what do you mean God? But if we look at John Peterson, and I do not mean to mock the man here at all, he is severely depressed. So something is not in alignment with that worldview. And I would say that no matter how utilitarian your worldview is, if you do not really believe that there is a God, you will suffer. You will be depressed. In fact, we find this promise in the Quran. And whoever turns away from my remembrance, indeed, he will have a depressed life.
And that's basically what it boils down to, because yes, we do have a better outcome if people believe in God. However, for this to be sustainable, we need to cultivate a true belief in God. We cannot just pretend to believe in God and then say, ah, because of our value system, society is progressing. This wouldn't be much different than communism. If you look at China, for example, their society is progressing. And yes, they're fighting degeneracy actively as well. However, they are a godless society. They are communists and they obey obey the rules. They're playing by the rules and therefore they have a progressive society. It works on the surface level. But within a religious mind, we're of course thinking about the afterlife as well. We're not thinking only about this creation, only about this dunya. Of course, we're trying our very best to make this existence as productive, as fertile as we can. But the real focus has to be the afterlife. And we are missing that point if we see God only as a concept. Even the idea of opposing evil as a whole is a belief in God. So you're either an evil person or you believe in God in some regard. And then you believe in good. I became, once I understood that there had to be an equal and opposite force, I was raised Christian. I live in a Christian nation. Romania is actually, I think, the second or third most Christian country on earth. It's a very Christian country here. It's churches everywhere. They, they strongly believe. And that's where I began my journey. But I always had a very healthy respect for Islam because I understand that to a degree, to have a religion at all, you have to have an intolerance to a degree. 100%. Because without an intolerance, you don't have rules, you don't have laws, you don't have any like you said, you have to earn God's respect. Coming from an Orthodox Christian background and then reverting to Islam myself, I have to absolutely agree here, we have to be intolerant. But guess what? Not only as religious people, but as people in general. And everybody is intolerant. Even the oh-so-tolerant leftist is absolutely intolerant. If you do not agree with their agenda, you become a bigot. So therefore, they are discriminating against you. Think about it. Ooh, an outrageous example here. If you talk to a leftist and you ask them, is everybody included in your ideology? They will tell you, yes, of course, come on over. But if you ask them, how about Nazis? How about right-wing extremists, quote-unquote? Are Nazis welcome in this safe place as well? Of course, they will get outraged and tell you no, because yet again, you are a bigot. So therefore, there is no real inclusion in any type of ideology, even in the perceived oh-so-nice social justice movements are, of course, extremely intolerant. And if we bring it back to religion, of course, we have to be intolerant as well, because what is a religion? A religion is a belief system, a belief system system of values that you hold dearly. So if your religion tells you that homosexuality is not permitted, then you cannot be tolerant of homosexuality. You have to hold on to the rope of your religion, so to speak, and defend that value system. Just as the LGBT people defend their ideology, it is exactly the same, and they're both intolerant. They're competing ideas ultimately, and you can only test a competing idea by defending it, and if you can defend it properly, then you win. And guess what you win? You win the future of your children. Do you understand? If leftist ideologies win, then your children might believe that they are girls or boys or something in between. If Islam wins, your children will believe that there is one God worthy of worship. This is the value behind it. If you're a religion which is tolerant of everything, then you don't have to earn God's respect. You can be a bad person and do bad things. God loves me, so it's fine. Well, no, it's not, because sure. that's not the point of the religion. So then you extrapolate that out, and I was sitting and thinking, well, what's the primary function of a religion? And the primary function... I have to cut it off one more time, because he said that's not the primary focus of religion. However, I have to disagree here, because within Christianity, and. Unfortunately, it is the primary focus of the religion. It is about forgiveness, that God forgives you your sins through his son sacrificing himself for you. This is the doctrine of Christianity. The doctrine of Christianity tells you that your sins are forgiven because Jesus died on the cross for you. For me, this was extremely irresponsible. And I have to say that I have nothing but love for my Christian brothers and sisters. But nevertheless, I understood as a man that I have to take full responsibility. I look back on my life and I realize that all the sins that I have committed, I have committed. And nobody can change it. Nobody can take that away from me. But I myself have to stand up for my dignity. I have to repent in front of God. I have to understand where it went wrong. It was my fault. I submit to God. I repent to God. 
please God forgive me. Only this mindset can purify your heart. If I believe that Jesus died for my sins, what is stopping me? I can go out, I can drink alcohol, I can commit sinner fornication. Who cares? I'm not afraid of God because, hey, God killed himself. He killed his son for me. My sins are washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the doctrine of Christianity. And this is why it is so problematic. And I believe that this is why we see the West falling. Of a religion, I don't believe is the religion exists so I can live forever. I mean, that's a, that's a nice thought. But I think on a macro level, the primary objective of a religion is we to do. restore and contain some degree of traditional value within the society. How do you judge, let me change the Utilitarianism, right again. How do you judge the success of a religion? I don't think you can judge it by the number of people who join it, because there's lots of people who are Catholic who don't act Catholic. They don't act in any way particularly Christian. Anyone can say they're something. You can walk into a strip club and everyone says they're a Christian. It doesn't mean anything, right? Technically. So how do you judge the success of a religion? Well, I like to think the best way to judge the success of a religion is how successful is it at fighting evil? How successful is it at preserving the morality of a population in X parameter, in, in X Geographic. It's a good, productive, pragmatic way of looking at it. I do understand why he would take this approach, because he simply looks at the evidence. He looks at what works and what doesn't. Well, Eric, I get it. That makes so sense. So when you look at it from that way, you can't say that Islam isn't the most successful religion on earth. It's the most successful in regards to opposing evil. It's the most successful in regards to opposing its differing viewpoints. It's the yes. most successful in regards to having people act within the, the limits and the confines of what it finds to be moral and good to God. It's the most adhered to, it's the most feared, sure. it's the most respected in most forms. And then also I'd like to think... I, I would say it's the most feared. Yeah, it's the most feared. But what is respect without fear? Do, do we respect men we don't fear? If there's a man who could do absolutely nothing to you on any level at all, you might be nice to him, sure, because we're not bad people. But would you really respect him? If you could take his chick in front of his face and set his car on fire, and he wouldn't do a thing. You wouldn't respect him. You might be nice to him because we're not bullies, but you wouldn't respect him. Respect and fear are linked. They're not always the same thing, and you can, you can maybe have fear without respect, but it's very hard to have respect without fear. He's pointing out something extremely important here, the fear aspect. And the fear aspect is, of course, frowned upon nowadays. Society has become very weak and very detached from nature as well. You see, for example, anti-bullying laws everywhere. Guys, don't get me wrong. Of course, nowadays, everything goes to extremes, even the bullying. However, bullying in its natural state is a normal mechanism of selection. This is how boys understand who is on top of the hierarchy, who is the alpha male even from childhood out on it is completely natural but society nowadays tries to destroy everything of course when you see sports nowadays hey children there is no winner anymore everybody wins no second places but that is not real that is not true just as it's not real that a man is a woman just because he puts on a woman's dress no he's not a woman but society goes along with it yes yes you go queen and because society goes along with all of this stuff and becomes weaker and weaker and says yes and amen to everything this is why they have a negative connotation when it comes to fear as well but he is absolutely accurate here fear and respect go hand in hand and ultimately every society is built like that if you look at the united states for example you have a legal and justice system so you have to have some sort of fear of that legal and justice system to not commit any type of atrocities of course it is not bulletproof and therefore we see that people do not fear it enough Enough. However, try the same thing in Saudi Arabia. It's not going to work because people fear the system. So yet again, I understand people nowadays don't want to accept that. I don't want to live in fear. But the reality is you have to have a natural fear of something. Even a wife that is loving her husband has a natural fear of her husband. Because usually, generally speaking, naturally speaking, the husband is stronger than the woman. And he is her protector. So on some deep level, level she's actually afraid of him she has a natural healthy fear for her husband that in turn is her protector that is good a normal human being that is not fallen has the fear of god instilled in his heart as well that is a natural state and islam is the only religion that has this fear of god still intact within it and therefore is able to defend it and by that standard it leads to fear in the hearts of the disbelievers and that is a good thing i would say because it leads to confrontation and it leads to respect because people try to attack the ideology but they see they cannot 
not like this islam is establishing a firm ground that cannot be shaken and like this islam establishes that it's here to stay but also i i, I heard someone say once that we see the world as we see ourselves if you're a thief you think everyone's a thief if you're a liar you think everyone's a liar and i i kind of agree with that i understood that i also oh. like to think we see religion as we see ourselves I like to see myself as a person whose respect you have to earn. I like to see myself as a person who has strong, rigid boundaries. I like to see myself as a person who will stand up and say, no, that's wrong. I like to see myself as a person who's not afraid of being shamed by whatever community for saying, I don't agree with that particular ideal. I like seeing myself that way. So if I'm gonna see myself that way, then I'm gonna naturally align with a religion that operates within that form. So when I say Islam is the last religion on earth, I say- I have to add here and disclaimer, I'm not an Islamic scholar, that Islamically speaking, we talk about the fitra. The fitra is the natural predisposition of man. And therefore, when we return to that, when we return to God, when we return to our natural state as human beings, we automatically line up with Islam. And therefore, the attributes that Andrew Tate listed here as his own, his attributes that align with Islam, I will go one step further and say that by by him returning to his natural state, he is in alignment with those God-given natural attributes. There is a right and a wrong, remember? So that means there is a right way of being a man as well. And I believe, of course, as a Muslim speaking, that the closer we get to God, the closer we get to Islam, the more we become the man that we should become under God. Because it seems to be the only one who will stand up and say no. We don't care. No, that's not what the book says. No, I was raised Christian yeah. and, and Muslims as a whole, we have no problems with Christians. None at all. I don't want anyone to think I'm anti-Christian like I dislike Christians. We don't have a problem with Christians. We believe in a lot of the same things. We believe in Jesus. We put more respect on the name of Jesus than most Christians do. I just don't like the idea of people saying they're a Christian and saying, but because I'm a Christian, I can do whatever I want and throw all the rules away and none of it matters. Because once you have that level of tolerance, you no longer have a religion. Again, I don't want to go on a too long tangent here, but as I said already, many Christians take the position that Jesus died for their sins and therefore the old law has been overturned. We don't have to go back into the Old Testament. We don't have to listen to those old laws. We can do what we want, essentially. We are saved by grace. Islam seems to be the it's last sad. religion left with parameters. If you don't have parameters, you don't have a religion at all. So the closer I found myself to God, the closer I, saw, I found myself to Islam. That's just how it ended. All right, this is it for today's video. In the end, of course, I have to say belated welcome to Islam, brother Andrew. I believe that he is doing a fantastic job coming from the background that he comes from. He, of course, has a huge audience that resonates with his lifestyle, resonates with his speech, resonates with his perspective, and resonates with his path as a man, being born as a Christian, becoming an atheist, ultimately losing faith, then trying to get back to God through Christianity, and ultimately finding God within Islam. And I would say that he is, of course, not the first one to discover exactly that. Many people, myself included, wanted to return to Christianity because they wanted to return to God. I was never an atheist myself, but I dabbled in the New Age, drug culture, and whatnot. I wanted to get back to God. And the only way for me was Orthodox Christianity because I was born a Christian after all. So that's the only option, I guess. But ultimately, my yearning for God was not satisfied in Christianity because in Christianity as I said throughout the video my sins were just forgiven and I do understand that some people resonate with that they simply want to be forgiven they simply want to move on but move on to what you're gonna move on and do the exact same mistakes over and over again because there is no real consequence but in life there's always a consequence everybody knows that anybody that left their house once in their life will understand that there's a consequence to any Anything you do in life. You have to look to the left, look to the right, so you don't get run over by a truck. Everything you do has a consequence. The education that you get in school or aside from that, the interactions with people that you have, the way that you think of yourself, if you work out or not. All of those parameters, all of those actions have consequences. If you cheat on your wife, that has a consequence as well. You have to calculate everything and you have to be held accountable and this is what it boils down to if you want to be a man in this world you have to be held accountable if your religion doesn't hold you accountable nothing will 
All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel by Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.